So our next speaker is Yuval Levenstein, who's coming in from Faculty of Chemistry, and who will give us a talk on super resolution tracking of nanomachines and DNA in nanotunnels arrays. Not entirely. I decided to change. I, I, I copied and pasted all kinds of different things to, to fit the time maybe a little bit uh, more. But before I start, please save me a box of that powder. Okay? I feel that I'm starting to need it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so. Uh, I'm, just, I'm going to touch upon uh, several different things that we do in the lab, that some of them will touch different people in the audience. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about are these light-driven nanosubmarines. This is also relevant in terms of the timing, because um, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, was given to these three people for their contribution on molecular synthetic machines, and specifically the guy uh, all the way, which one is the laser, this one, Feringa, who developed a very, very interesting molecular rotor. So this molecule, you can see it has uh, this uh, stator, and then it has a rotor, and um, this rotor changes its position, it isomerizes, upon UV radiation. And one of the interesting things about this structure is that it only rotates in one direction. It's not a symmetric structure, and so it has a, a preference to isomerizing in a certain direction, and probabilistically wise, it will always turn in one direction at a, a frequency of one to three megahertz. And this, of course, strikes the imagination as a little nanorotor. And what we wanted uh, to see is if we can actually see this rotor in action because it was actually not possible until today to track these kinds of machines that are on the molecular scale. Together with uh, James Tour from Rice University, is a very uh, pronounced uh, organic chemist dealing a lot with these nanomachines. Um, he connected these two Psi-5 molecules for us to this rotor. Uh, this wasn't enough, and I'll touch upon this a little bit later. We also connected these triplet quenchers, which stabilize the fluorescence of these molecules, really orders of magnitude, so that we can track them, because uh, the idea is that if we want to follow them, we have to be able to collect photons from these machines uh, for long times and get their trajectories. And, you know, this is the vision that we have. They even look like little uh, vehicles with this propeller on top. And the ch yes. <laughs> Now, um, one thing that's very, very important to understand is that these are much, much, much smaller than any natural occurring protein molecular motors. We know that there are a lot of molecular motors in nature, but when nature designs molecular motors, when they have to go something, they usually move on tracks. Either all those proteins that work on DNA and use DNA as their track to walk, or micro microtubules, or actin. There are uh, not a lot of functionally uh, uh, mobile molecular motors that rely only on diffusion. But inside the cell, a lot of molecular machines actually rely on pure random diffusion to reach their target and perform a task. Now, because these are so small, it's extremely hard to follow them by microscopy because they diffuse too fast, and you cannot get enough photons per unit of time to actually record their location. And this is why we decided uh, to trap them in these very narrow 45 nanometer cross-section uh, arrays of channels. And this effectively confines their diffusion to one dimension. Because they go, if they want to go sideways, they bump in the wall, go back, and this way we can basically slow them down because we're only focusing on one uh, of these axes. And indeed, using these nanochannels, we could get enough contrast and signal-to-noise to actually 
follow these individual uh, molecules and perform what is called single molecule tracking, where we basically can get very, very detailed trajectories of the movement of these uh, nanosubmarines. And uh, the very interesting uh, and maybe expected result is that the diffusion constant has really uh, jumped up twofold when we shine them with UV light. And of course we had a lot of controls to see that it's not heating and things like that, but uh, so they're faster. They sample more, more space in a unit of time when you shine them externally with UV and you start rotating this rotor. And this is very not trivial because you can imagine that the, the size of these machines is on the same order of magnitude as the size of the water molecules and buffer molecules in which it sits. So just imagine yourself trying to swim in a swimming pool full of basketballs that are bouncing around and hitting you at uh, 100 miles per uh, second. It's not trivial that, you know, doing this in this uh, basketball pool will uh, propel you anywhere. Uh, but indeed, they go faster. And the advantage of doing this on the single molecule level, so this is a bulk result, okay? We are aggregating all our data and we are checking how far from the center these things can expand in a unit of time. When you look at the individual trajectories, you can get additional information that can hint on the mechanism of what's going on. So intuitively what we thought is that when we look at it, in one unit of time, the ones that have a propeller will move more distance than the ones that don't have a working propeller. What we found out when analyzing the individual step size distribution is that most of the time they behave exactly the same. But the ones that have a working motor, once in a while, they make these huge leaps in solutions. And if we make the analogy to uh, this guy swimming in the basketball pool, imagine that he makes one stroke with his arms and he's suddenly at the other end of the pool or even outside the, the swimming pool country club. Okay, really very large steps. Uh, we don't have a theoretical framework for this yet, but it's a very interesting and intriguing result, and we're trying to, to, to resolve this theoretically. Maybe uh, there's a phenomenon called Levi flights. You know, when flies, they stand in the same place, and suddenly zip, you see them in another place. So may, these things may also work on the molecular uh, level, and we're trying to, to understand this now. Um, now, I want to talk about genome mapping. So, the major effort of the lab is basically genomics, mapping genomes, uh, and we do this using the same tools of single molecule microscopy and nanotechnology in the form of these uh, nanostructures that allows us to, uh, to look at DNA. Now, the reason that we do this except for the fact that it's fun and cool, and it's okay to do sometimes things that are only fun and cool, that's why we're in science and getting paid very little salaries. Uh, but another reason is to develop and do something that cannot be done in any other way, and this is what we think about the genomic technology that we're developing. Basically, we're trying to probe a region in genomics that is not really addressed by existing technologies. So when we do sequencing, we know how to sequence very short pieces of DNA, up to a few hundred bases. Uh, when we do cytogenetics, we know how to look at extremely large pieces of DNA, millions of bases, but actually in a very, very important domain of sizes, which are the sizes of our genes, there is no real technology that can probe these length scales of DNA. And what we try to do is basically take these chromosomes and unravel them so that we can stretch very, very long pieces of DNA, hundreds of thousands of bases to few millions of bases. And due to physical confinement, so DNA is very highly negatively charged, we can stick two electrodes at the two ends of these arrays, and DNA will be electrophoretically pulled into these arrays, and this is what we see here in the movie. This is a 400,000 
uh, base pair piece of DNA. Uh, we have these pillar arrays that become smaller and smaller, and this is kind of an entropy funnel, uh, because the entropy barrier over here between the random coil of the DNA that's just swimming in solution and taking a really large space, if it bounces again these, against these pillars, it will never go in. Just like your spaghetti in the spaghetti uh, pot where you put this uh, thing with the holes, you take the water out, the spaghetti stays in the thing. But if you had a mechanism that will shape each one of these spaghetti to be against the wall, they will go out, and this is exactly what we do here on the nano level. Uh, and again, due to this confinement in the nanochannels, the physically and entropically, the molecules have to stretch out. And now we have the potential of reading information along these molecules. And the way we do it is that we highlight fluorescently specific words of DNA, specific sequence motifs. We have enzymatic and chemical reactions that know how to do that. And basically, we get a pattern of dots along our DNA molecules. And this pattern of dots carries information. It carries information about the underlying sequence. And basically, it's a low resolution representation of the sequence of the molecule. And if we have enough density of information, uh, for example, these are molecules from human blood. And if we have a distinct enough pattern along these molecules, we can just walk along the theoretical reference of the human genome and find the place where these molecules exactly fit. So these blue lines were generated from the known sequence. We know where we are expecting to see fluorescent spots. If you look at this molecule, against every one of these lines, there's a fluorescent spot. So we know with very, very high confidence that it arrived from chromosome 5 from exactly this locus. And now what can be done that cannot be done in any other way? We get access to information that is very large scale. For example, here, you see every spot has a corresponding line, but suddenly on this part of the molecule, the lines become diagonal. What does this tell us? It tells us that there is a piece of DNA missing somewhere in this region. This is called a deletion, a genetic deletion. This is one of the things that makes all of us different from each other. Small aberrations in our genomic structure because the sequence of our, our genome is about 99.5 to 99.9 .9 identical. And the differences between people on the genetic level mostly span from these what are called structural variations things that are missing, duplicated, rearranged, all kinds of things, and these things we can see visually on the microscope. And another thing are these copy number variations. Take a zoom in on this. So about 40% of the human genome is composed of these repetitive elements, sequences that repeat themselves very many, many times. When you do sequencing, you never know how many times they repeat yourself because this is much, much longer than a read length, but on the microscope, we can physically see them as equally spaced dots of fluorescence, and you can see in this example that there are double the repeats than what is in the human genome reference. And again, this is a major point of variation between people, and also a major source of disease. Um, and I want to show you an application. Uh, this is a uh, work from uh, Asaf Grunwald, uh, and just, just uh, got into review in Nature Biotech. Uh, and here we are looking at a disease. This disease is uh, basically originated from a part on chromosome 4 that has this repetitive gene. And if you have less than 10 copies genetically of this gene, uh, you have the disease. And it's very, very difficult to diagnose because these are very long repeats. Each one of them is about 3,500 3, bases. And what we do here is that we can take images of many, many of these molecules. Uh, we use an algorithm that in an unsupervised manner kind of stitches everything together and gets a consensus and counts the number of repeats so that we know here now that we have exactly 23 repeats. And this is basically it's a diagnostic tool, and I will show you in a few slides how we enhance this diagnostic tool with epigenetics. But these structures are actually a fantastic tool for doing physics and polymer physics, because what we have here is a nature's creation where we have a molecular ruler uh, where we can attach 
a fluorescent beacon at predetermined distances, which are defined on the atomic level. Every certain number of base pairs of molecules, we, have, we can put a fluorescence marker. And uh, these things, even with all the technology that we have today, cannot be synthesized externally. Only nature can synthesize them because the millions of years of evolution uh, have developed these kinds of structures. So we use these uh, structures, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Jonathan Jeffett's works, uh, trying to understand the behavior of these biopolymers in solution, and also the application of how we can take this information back and use it uh, for enhancing the resolution uh, of our experiments. Now, DNA, because it stays in solution, it's dynamic and it fluctuates. If we want to study dynamics, we have to be able to look at these spots for a long time. And what happens is that they bleach very fast. What we see here is what's called the chemograph. Okay? This is time, and this is a piece of DNA with several fluorescent markers on it. And you see that we start to take the movie, and very quickly, they die. We don't have any more information. And this is where chemistry comes into play. Uh, instead of putting a normal fluorophore, again, we have a fluorophore where we covalently, and this is done by Doron Shabbat's lab in the chemistry department, we covalently attach a triplet quencher. And this basically, it's a sink for all these excited state uh, electrons that can cause the molecule to photobleach, they actually take them back and return the molecule to the ground state. And this way you can see here that they just, they don't turn off, okay? These molecules are stable, they stop blinking, and we can take them for thousands of frames versus 25 frames before. So this is just a little bit, a little trick in, of chemistry that can really help the physics of the experiment. So this is how these molecules look like. You can see that the molecule is fluctuating in the channel, and step by step molecules are bleaching and turning off. And again, if you draw a chemograph of this kind of behavior, you can really visually see the fluctuations. And it's very clear that the DNA is fluctuating. It's fluctuating on the local level, but it's also fluctuating on the global level. You can see these correlations in the movement of the DNA. Now, in order to get very precise information, we do what's called super resolution uh, localization. We fit a 2D Gaussian to each one of these spots at every time frame. And we can basically localize the location of every fluorescent spot in a resolution of about 30 nanometers. It only depends on the number of photons that you can extract, extract from your sample. Uh, this is the, the theoretical limitation, the number of photons. And this is about 100 base pairs. And here, basically, you can see the high resolution chemograph and inside this box, I just show you these, these correlated global movements. You see that there is this kind of ripple in the movement, and the whole molecule, for a very long range in the molecule, moves together. And we found out that this is the main limitation on our resolution, because what we are interested in is the arrangement of the dots. And if the DNA moves during acquisition, we are not sure that the dots are actually in their equilibrium position because it's kind of an harmonic system. And this can get us, a, a, gives us a resolution, if we take three standard deviations, about 1,500 base pairs. And this is the standard procedure. This is how people work. A, what Jonathan tried to do is to take a little bit different concept. Instead of looking at the absolute locations of these molecules, let's calculate the distances between spots. This way we can basically erase all the collective movement and when you do that, indeed, you can see that here the lines are much straighter. We're basically erasing out all of this collective movement of the molecule just by looking at distances instead of looking at locations. And we reduce twofold uh, these fluctuations so that now we have a accuracy of 700, uh, 750 base pairs. So two times better. This is not the end of the story. Of course, if you're taking movies instead of snapshots, there's a price to pay, and the, the price is time. So the first thing that we checked is, well, actually, we checked two things. First of all, how is this improvement worthwhile? Is it giving us better results? And this can be easily done just by doing cross-correlation between 
uh, the theoretical pattern of dots that you're expecting and what you get in the, in the experiment. And you can see that after this averaging procedure with distances, the cross-correlation uh, between the theory and experiment is really boosted up. The, the, the difference between 0.88 and 0.92 for us is extreme. Okay? It means that we need many, many, much, much less data in order to achieve the same genetic conclusion. So there is a big boost in confidence when we do this procedure, but it's costing us a lot of time. So what we checked here is how the score, the confidence score, behaves as a function of the number of frames that we took, and we see that we were totally overestimating the need, and you actually, there's a very, very quick rise in confidence that appears actually, now we know that it's even less than 50 frames, so instead of taking 1,000 frames, it's really enough to take 50 frames, sometimes even 20 frames, and really boost the performance uh, of your mapping. Um, but let's see if we can take it a little bit uh, further than that. How am I doing with time? Okay. Um, listen, when you take these structures, and now you stretch them, you take this double helix, and you stretch it open, you find out that each one of these spots is actually composed of two fluorophores. These fluorophores are 670 base pairs away, so they are too close to be resolved optically just in the channels. That is why we see them as a single spot. Uh, now, super resolution basically knows how to take care of these kinds of samples by turning on inducing, for example, blink blinking, and just turning each one of these fluorophores at a time. But in our case, the fluctuations are killing us. Because if we just induce blinking, we never know, because it's fluctuating, we never know if it belongs to the left or the right molecule. Uh, again, what Jonathan did here is to go to distance measurements instead of localization measurement. Think of the following, of the following case. We have here a stable anchor fluorescent marker. And here we have this pair of fluorophores. Each one of them is emitting a Gaussian-shaped profile. Because they are close together, these Gaussians are summed, and what we see is a single Gaussian-like intensity distribution with a centroid, if we fit a 2D Gaussian, which is exactly in between the two. So if we measure the distance between these two, we get a certain distance. At a certain time, one of these molecules is going to die. It's going to bleach. What's going to happen is now we only have the contribution from the right molecule. So this Gaussian has shifted and came closer to the second Gaussian. If we measure the distance now, we actually have a distance. And the difference between these distances is exactly half the distance between these two fluorophores. And indeed, this works experimentally. You can see here, this is a 3D reconstruction of the, of the movie, of the intensity distribution. This is our stable anchor, okay? And here we see a high intensity, and at a certain stage, one of these fluorophores turns off, and we have a lower intensity. This is how it looks. The stable anchor is pretty stable along the measurement. And here we have two fluorophores, and then a photobleaching step, tuck, and only one fluorophore. Now, if we correlate the distance measurement, again, we have a certain distance, which is far, and then when this, exactly when this one bleaches, tuck, the distance shrinks, and the difference in distance here is exactly half the distance between the fluorophores, and indeed, uh, the genomic distance is 676 base pairs, uh, the distance that we measure is 670 base pair, because we have a high, a relatively high error because of these fluctuations, but still, taking into account that we reached the order of 100 base pairs, we've increased the resolution of this technology about tenfold uh, doing this. And this was recently published in ACS Nano. Uh, so this is the summary of what we do. We can really resolve these sub-diffraction limited structures on the DNA if we really make an effort. Why is this useful for the last minutes of my talk? Um, because we want to study information that is many times at very high resolution. And the most interesting thing for us to study is what is called epigenetics or chemical DNA modifications. Because each one of us has 
hundreds of cell types in his body, and they all carry his own genome. Exactly the same code, but they are extremely different. And the reason that they are different, like these two cells coming from the same human, is that there is an additional layer of information encoded into the genome in the form of very subtle chemical modifications of the bases that don't change the base. It will still be sequenced at A, G, C, and T, but functionally, physically, chemically, they can really change the function of DNA. Um, in humans, most of these happen on the C base. This is cytosine. The most known is methylcytosine. So just adding this little bump, molecular bump, uh, has dramatic effects on DNA. Uh, and there is hydroxymethylcytosine. I think I won't have time uh, to talk about it today. So this methyl group, just uh, as a convention, it's scattered along the genome quite homogeneously. But about 10% of these, of, these, uh, of these seeds that can be methylated are concentrated in islands. These are called CPG islands that are right on the promoters of genes, on the regions that make genes work. And conventionally, we tend to think that if they are methylated, the gene is shut down. Okay? So this is a molecular switch that can turn genes on and off and change uh, the function of the cell. Now, this is the work uh, by Asaf, which we continued from just looking at the genetics and the copy number variation. We also want to look at the methylation. We have an enzymatic reaction which is methylation sensitive and can distinguish between methylated and unmethylated DNA by the amount of fluorescence. This is one example where we compare primary blood DNA to a cell line that was derived from, from this primary DNA. Now, more green means less methylation. Okay, because we are labeling the unmethylated CPGs. You can see that the cell line was, is much, much more green. It has much less methylation. And the reason is that when we immortalize cells to turn them into a cell line, which is very similar to what happens in cancer, there is a dramatic loss of methylation in the genome. And we can see this visually and we can quantify this very, very precisely uh, and see the degree of methylation in a specific cell type. But it doesn't end here because now we have these individual molecules and we can look at individual methylation patterns, epigenetic patterns along these molecules. And this is just one example from chromosome one. Asaf found these three molecules. They're about 200, 250,000 uh, bases. All three of them align to exactly this locus. And let's see what we can immediately see here. So we align the molecules with the genetic labels and now we're looking only at the methylation pattern. So first of all, it's nice to see that all three molecules have a quite similar methylation pattern, which makes sense. Uh, but we are, obviously, we're interested in these little differences, and we actually have now a way on the single cell level to see these differences in, in methylation. Another thing to look at, this is the reference of all the CPGs in the genome, the gray lines. So we can I, detect here two CPG islands. And these are associated with these two genes. And we can see very clearly that one of them is unmethylated on all three molecules, and the other is methylated on all three molecules. And indeed, this is a housekeeping gene, which is supposed to be very highly expressed, and the promoter is unmethylated. This is a muscle-related uh, gene, not expected to be in blood. And indeed, you don't see a signal, so it's very highly methylated. So I think it's a very powerful technique. Uh, maybe just to summarize, this part, we have taken this now to the next level. We're working with, with patients of FSHD. And when you look at the DNA of these patients, first of all, something that's, uh, at least for the biologists here, we can do what's called haplotyping. We can distinguish the two different alleles in chromosome four because we have one set of molecules that aligns very nicely to the reference of chromosome four. This is the general genome reference. And we do what's called de novo assembly on these molecules. And we see that we, they cluster to two variants. There are two groups. All of them are identical in this part. But at the other part, they are different. And these are basically the two alleles, uh, which are called 4QA and 4QB. And when we look at the methylation, we are doing dual labeling now, genetic and epigenetic. We can actually count how many repeats. We can see that we have five repeats in 4QA. We have eight repeats in 4QB. Both cases less than 10, and indeed 
these people are sick. Um, I forgot to delete these slides, but I'm going to the end. Okay, just look at the outlook in the last minute that I have for the talk. What we really want to do, doing whole genome experiments is really difficult. It's a lot of work, it took us years. Uh, we want to do targeted genomics. We want to be able to look only at the region that's interesting for us, medically, developmentally, kinds of ways, and identify the locus looking at the genetic tags, identify, for example, which tissue the DNA comes from by looking at the stable uh, modifications, and identifying very small subpopulations by uh, looking at pathogenic transformations, for example. And this is the idea, and just my last slide, one, one step closer that we got to fulfilling this, and this again, just submitted for publication. This is a work from Tzlil. Uh, what we know how to do today is to take cells, trap them in agarose, then we, saw, we lyse the cells. So now we have genomes trapped in agarose gel. And now we use something very hot today. It's called Cas9. It's basically a programmable restriction enzyme. We can tell it exactly where to cut the DNA at what sequence by introducing a little RNA guide to it. And what we do, we choose a region in the genome that's interesting for us, and we design two of these molecular scissors that cut on the two ends of this region. And then we use gel electrophoresis to take out the band. You can see very clearly a 200,000 base pair band coming out. Most of the cells are trapped in the agarose. This band, we cut out this band with the DNA, and now we show that we can do now nanopore sequencing of just selectively this region of the DNA and also optical mapping exactly of this uh, region. And with this, I'd like to end. I want to thank, first of all, a really, really, really fantastic team of great people. A lot of them are sitting here. Uh, and collaborations. I love collaborations because they make things work faster. And uh, money is also really, really important. So I thank all my money. And thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Impressive, Yuval. A question. You said that you talked in the very last part about single cells, but what you showed was from a cell line. So the question is, can you actually do this on a single cell level? So what I always say is that we are doing single cell genomics without the need to process single cells. Because when I look at a region in the genome and I look at individual molecules and they all come from this locus, each one of these molecules most likely comes from a different cell. And I, compare, I can compare them directly. The chances that these are two alleles from the same cell out of millions of cells is very, very slim. So we are actually doing single cell experiments, but we are processing the cells in bulk. Listen, I for sure I can't, okay? I can hardly use scotch tape on a piece of paper. So you want, but, uh, um, right, breaking this, even breaking the symmetry of the, of the backbone might change, but, okay, it's under review. We're waiting to see what the reviewer comments are, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of work after that. But we are, we are thinking of ideas how to continue this project. Uh, again, for, for those motors, you didn't mention what fraction of the time a actually a single motor is active. Probably a small fraction of the time. So stating that most of the diffusion pattern is the same is an outcome of this situation that probably motors are, are, are spoiled. I mean, like in the submarines, our submarines, most of the motors that are on the dock and don't operate, but only a small at the time. Yes, so, um, 
Definitely, there is about a thousand-fold difference between the rotate. They are always rotating. This has been shown. But they rotate at one megahertz, and the, 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 the frequency of collisions is, I don't know, 10, 100,000, 10,000 times higher. So effectively, most of the time, the medium does not see a rotating motor. So, I mean, this is my intuition, but we have to put it into numbers and formulas and see if there's anything that makes sense. Thank you. Have some more.